Good. Uh, like I said, by the time we reach Revelation 22, we will have this dumb 30. All right, so today, before I get into today's class, I want to um, do a little review on the church at Ephesus. Uh, remember, we studied Ephesus last week, and the the Bible or the Lord, He gave us a very good background to the church at Ephesus, and there is no other church among the seven churches where we will get this background. So, Ephesus. If you're looking for information on Ephesus, you will find it in the book of Acts, you will find it in the book of Ephesians, and you will find it in the book of Revelation. Today we will be doing the book of Smyrna, and there is no information on Smyrna anywhere else in the Bible but in the book of Revelation. And you will find this with the other books also. So the Church of, of Ephesus, we said Paul first visited the Church of Ephesus in 52 AD, and I told you that you can read Acts chapter 18, 19, and 20, and you will get the background to the, the church at Ephesus. Um, Paul stayed in Ephesus a little while, uh, not, not long, he stayed a short, a short period of time, and he, he was on his way to Jerusalem, he was there to keep a feast. After Paul left, a guy by the name of Apollos, he, uh, he came through Ephesus. And he had a, a very good report. They say he was a, a devout man. He was eloquent. He was very strong in the scriptures. And he stayed in, in Ephesus for a while. And Paul, two friends, Aquila and Priscilla, when they heard Apollos preach, and an amazing thing happened just, just a couple of days ago. I was doing a little research on Apollos. And Apollo, we, we managed to see the very first appearance of Apollos in the book of Acts when he came in. And all he knew was the baptism of John the, the, the Baptist. He didn't know about the Holy Spirit. He didn't know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when Aquila and uh, uh, Priscilla heard him teaching in the church, they pulled him aside and they said to him, hey, let us tell you the whole story. And they sat down and they imparted their knowledge of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit into him. So they had a very important part in, in molding Apollos' ministry. And if you decide to follow the the, the ministry of Apollos, you will see in the church of Corinth, there was a, 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 a little discussion, an argument, a fight, where some of the, the church members were saying, hey, hold on, I am of Paul. The other one said, I am of Peter. The other one said, I am from Apollos. And Apollos, he did an amazing job. And we had the opportunity to see him at the very beginning of his ministry. Paul told the people of Ephesians, he said, I will be coming back in a little bit. And um, he, it took him two years to get back there. So he came back. He came... Hold on. All right. He came back in 54 AD. That is in Acts chapter 19, verse 1 through 10. And he found, he found 12 men who were disciples. And I believe that they were the disciples of Apollos. And he asked them, hey, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And, and they, said, he, they said to him, what, what is the Holy Ghost? We don't know anything about the Holy Ghost. That tells you that they were Apollos uh, disciples. And he, he told them about the Holy Spirit, and he shared with them uh, the, all the information they need to know about the Holy Spirit, and then they were baptized by the Holy Spirit. So Apollos, he did a great job. Now, after these 12 received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you had 
uh, 12 men, then you had Paul, and then you had uh, uh, Priscilla and uh, Aquila. And they started an awakening in, in the, 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 the city of Ephesus. And the Bible says that God worked together with Paul and performed great miracles. Remember, we talk about uh, Paul preaching with aprons and, and handkerchiefs hanging from his body. He didn't have an expensive suit. And um, God, God did great miracles. There was a great awakening in the city of Ephesus. And um, after a while, all the people who, who was involved in witchcraft and soothsaying and palm reading and stuff like that, they bought all the books and they decided to burn them. It was uh, today's worth. Five million dollars worth of books. They had a big bonfire. Then we talk about um, Demetrius. He used to make silver. He was a silversmith, and he made statues of uh, Diane, the goddess Diane, and and his trade was going down. So it affected the economy. And then uh, in AD 54, when Paul returned, he was on his third missionary um, journey, and on his way back. He stopped at a place called Miletus uh, in 58 AD, and he did not want to go to Ephesus because, again, he was going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And the fact that Paul called the elders of the church of uh, Ephesus tell you that the church was already established. They had their elders and they had their pastors and stuff like that. And they, they was a power to reckon with. Uh, in the year 95 AD, Ephesus, the, the bishop of Ephesus was Timothy, the same Timothy that we know of. And Timothy, he died around AD, um, all right, I have a, I have a little problem here. Uh, let, me, let me see if I could get to, to my slide. I'm trying to get this. Uh, give me one second, guys. Slides working. Plus, what exactly are you trying to do? Uh, I'm trying to get the slide screen working, and I have a a screen uh, right. it uh, goes toolbar. To which part your mouse is right now. You see that little box with a play icon inside of it? Yeah. But I would start from this beginning. So to the bottom of the screen, yeah. and where you would adjust the, the size right there, that, that one. That would take you to the PowerPoint view. All right. Hold on. All right, slide show. Right, resume. so the apps resume. All right. I, I thought I hit it. Oh, no, just no. Resume slides. Yeah, resume slideshow. I, I left click it. Okay, what you could do then, you could start the slideshow from on top. And well, this other to slide 20. So, right. Hold on. Yeah, that, that would open the slideshow. No, left click. Left click. Yeah, left click. No, I'm not, still not getting it. Hold on, I, I, I could do it from here. Slideshow from, I'm back to the same position.
<sighs> click when it click start slideshow, it's not starting on the next screen. No, I'm not starting. No, I'm not starting. You're left clicking, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, let's let's go. We 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 do it as is. I could I could do it. All right. So Timothy was the pastor. You guys still seeing the slides, right? Yeah, you're good to go. So it's just a click 2021 20, and as you go. All right. Okay, sorry about this, guys. Um, we are still reviewing the church of Ephesus. And the Lord said, I know thy works, thy labor, thy patience, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and has tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Now, on the, on the right-hand side, you would see Acts chapter 20, verse 29, that after my parting, this is when Paul was passing through in AD 58, he, he told them, he said, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And then in Acts chapter 20, verse 30, speaking perverse, perverse things to, uh, to draw away many disciples after them. And then in Timothy chapter 1, uh, 1 Timothy 1, 3, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. This was in AD 64. So what happened was the church of Ephesus, they received proper doctrine. They were taught, they were, they were taught what to look out for. They, they, they were taught that evil men will come into the church and try to separate the congregation Man will come and try to draw away people from the um, from the flock. So they were they were taught they were sound in doctrine, and then uh, and has borne and has patient and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Revelation chapter two verse three. Thou thou hatest the deed of the Nicolaitans. This also is a sign that they were they had sound doctrine this was this was by far the perfect church this was the perfect church they had sound doctrine they had miracles going for them they had they had everything you could imagine so when we look at the church of ephesus we will say this is a a church that I want to be a member of. However, the person who was looking at the church is the one who was walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And he said, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you left your first love. He did not say you, your love died. He said you left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou hast fallen. The Lord considered leaving your first love as a state of uh, a, a fallen state. That's, that's how he sees the church leaving their first love as being in a fallen state. And he said, remember, repent, remember for whence you are fallen, repent and repeat the first words or else I will move the candlesticks out of its place. He that overcome it, will I give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of paradise of God. So let's get to today's lesson. Church of Smyrna. I'm still trying to get this thing going for some reason. All right. The Church of Smyrna. The word Smyrna means myrrh, it means bitter, 
the description of Christ, these things said the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. So let us talk about the first and the last. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4. Who has performed this and carried out, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and the last. I am he. Now, I want you to just give me a second here. I want you to observe this. He said, you know, with all my slides, I'm going, I'm, I'm losing it. Who has performed this and carried it out, calling forth the generation from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and the last, I am he. I want you to observe this. I am he. The next, the next verse, Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus said the Lord, the King, the Redeemer of Israel, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, there is no God but me. Again, pay attention to this. I am the first, I am the last. Listen to me, O Israel, O Jacob, whom I have called. I am he, I am the first. I am the last, Isaiah 48, 12. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, Revelation 1, 17, Revelation 22, 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now, what I want you to observe here, I am, I am, I am, I am the first, I am the last, I am Alpha and Omega. When Moses, when he saw the burning bush, and he asked the Lord, well, who shall I say, send me? In Hebrew, he said, asher aia. I am that I am that send you. So Jesus is the first, and there, is, there could be no other first than the first. And I copied, I copied this, uh, this statement I'm going to read it for you. Christ as the Alpha and Omega is the first and the last in so many ways. He is the author and finisher of our faith, signifying that he begins it and carry it through to completion. He is the totality, the sum and the substance of the scripture, both the law and the of the gospel. He is the fulfilling end of the law. He is the beginning subject matter of the gospel of grace through faith, not of works. He is, he is found in the first verse in Genesis and in the last verse of, the, of Revelation. He is the first and the last, the all in all of salvation from the justification before God to the final sancti sanctification of his people. Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Only God incarnate could make such a, clear, a statement. Only Jesus Christ is God incarnate. So Jesus being the first and the last is is no other but the first and the last. So I would like to show you this in Genesis. He said, the Lord is found in, in the, the first, the Lord is found in the, in the beginning of the Bible, the very first verse in the Bible. This here is uh, uh, Genesis chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. On the left-hand side, you will see it written in Hebrew. And this here is an aleph, and it means one, numeral number one. This word here is Bereshit, and Bereshit means in the beginning. Bara, but the word bara means create. 
this word here is Elohim, and this word here is Et, the Aleph Tav. This here is Hasha Mayaim, the Et Haaret. In the beginning, created God, the heaven and the earth. Now, I'm sorry, I don't have my marker to show you this. Aleph Tav is the first and the last. This is where Jesus is found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 in the Hebrew Bible. Let's go on. I know thy works. I, I, I have a little problem here. For some reason, one screen is, is blank. I have two screens, and for some reason, it's not showing. Anyhow, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. But thou art rich, Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. Again, we talked at length on the last day about your works. And the final conclusion was that every human being will be judged according to their works. I know thy works, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. The books. We were, when we get to that chapter, we will deal with the other books that was open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Now, this is the second judgment. This is the white throne judgment. This is the judgment for the unsaved people. And everybody, everybody in the world, from Cain and Abel, from Adam and Eve, to today's date and everybody who will be dead during the tribulation period, every human being will be judged according to their works. And in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. So again, at the end of the Bible, Jesus is still talking about given every man according to his works. We said last day that work start with a cup of water. Just by just giving a cup of water in the name of Jesus with the right attitude, he writes that down in his book. So everything, he said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was in prison, you visited me. I was, I was sick. I was sick and you, you visited me. So everything is written down in, in the book. And we will be judged, everyone will be judged according to their works. He said, I know your tribulation. The church of Smyrna was going through a tribulation period. And it is not the tribulation of the revelation, but they were being persecuted. They... They were poor, and the Lord said, I know your poverty, I know your tribulation, I know your works. He said, but you are rich. You, he said, you are rich. The reason why they were poor was because their, their property was confiscated because of the trials that they were going through. So the Lord is aware of everything. He's aware of everything that you do. He's aware of everything that you are going through, and he's aware of your physical and spiritual and financial position. He said, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and they're not, but are the synagogue of Satan. And this is what we call fake Jews. And they say they are Jews, but they are not. We had the same problem in the, in the church of Ephesus that they, they said they were Jews and, and the, the church of Ephesus found them to be liars. 
And there is also what we call fake Christians today. And they are not Christians. He said, well, I got, I got something to tell you. He said, I know you are going through tribulation, but fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Guess what? More suffering is coming your way, he said. He said, you will have more suffering. He said, behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that he may be tried and he shall have tribulation 10 days. Now we will not try to spiritual, spiritualize this, that he shall have tribulation 10 days. It, it is possible that the, the church was going through a particular period in time when there was a game that was going on and they used Christians as lamps. They would light them up and they would burn them to the stake so that they would have light. It could have been a period of time like that. But I want you to, I want to show you something here. The source of your trial is always the devil. He said, behold, the devil shall cast some of you, and not everybody, but some of you, he will cast some of you in prison. So the source of your testing, the, the source of your tribulation, the, the, the source of your trial is the devil. And the reason why you are going through this is that you may be tried. And when I think about the reason why we go through trials, I, I, um, I think about a butterfly. A butterfly, or let's say a chicken. You, 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 you'll be more familiar with a chicken trying to break its way through an egg. And this chicken will pick at that eggshell and then it will struggle to go come through that eggshell. But it have to go through that eggshell in order to be strong. In recent times, I discover that when a baby is born through natural childbirth, there are so many, so much benefits for a child being born through natural childbirth than a child being born through a, a C-section. The child have to go through that testing period before it is born and certain things happen to that baby and it is good for that baby. When, when you have a C-section with a baby, that's a shortcut. And there's the same things that would save that, that save that baby's life for nine months is the same thing that could destroy that baby's life after a C-section. Same thing with a Christian. You have to go through testing. You have to go through a little trial because you will become a weak Christian. If everything is smooth, you're gonna have a problem. But the, the Lord is telling this church, he said, I know you are going through some tribulation, but i tell you what, there is more to come. And the source of this tribulation or this testing is the devil himself. He said, but I want you to do one thing. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. All right? Do not fear. And, and let, me, let, let me show you these three scripture verses. You, and I think everybody would be familiar with this one. If he have faith as a grain of mustard seed, he shall say to the mountain, be removed from hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing is impossible for you. Well, with this church, it wasn't like that. It wasn't easy like that. And, and I think, I, I, I am just assuming that everybody heard this this uh, this example that preachers would normally give about the, 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 the faith, like a grain of mustard seed, and you're saying to the mountain, be removed. There's this woman, she was living at the foot of a mountain, and she read this scripture. And um, she realized that, hey, if I have faith of a grain of mustard seed, I could say to this mountain, be removed, and it will, be, it, it will move from in front of my house. So she will get up in the morning, face the mountain, close her eyes and pray, be thou removed. And then she would open her eyes and say, just as I thought, 
the mountain is still there. God does not always remove the mountain, but he will give you strength in your legs to climb the mountain. God did not remove this testing from these people. He did not remove the, the trials that they were going through. And then there's an, uh, another verse I want to share with you, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There had no temptation taken you, at such as is common to man, but God is faithful who shall not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that he may be able to bear it. So again, I, I use the word, uh, the Bible used the word temptation there, but he said your trials and your testing is not above what you are able to be. But the third verse that I want to share with you is Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32, where Jesus told Simon, he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has this, had desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. I have built a hedge around thee. I have commanded the devil not to touch you. No, Jesus didn't do that. He didn't do that. He said, I, I have prayed for thee that thy faith will not fail. Not that Simon wouldn't go through the testing. The, and again, pay attention to this. It is Satan's desire to have you. The source of the testing, the source of your temptation is the devil. But Jesus himself said, I have prayed for thee. Not that the temptation wouldn't come. Not that the testing wouldn't come, but that your faith will not fail. And Jesus was quite aware that, uh, that Peter will be strengthened at the end of, of that testing. He said, but when thou art converted, you strengthen your brethren. So for this church, they were going to suffer. They were going to have more suffering. Jesus told them, do not be afraid. The next slide, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So, so they, he told him, he said, I know that you have trials, you have testing. And then he said, you're going to get more testing. And some of you will be cast into prison. But he said, guess what? I, I, I got to tell you this. Some of you will have to die. Some of you will die in prison. I guess you might be seeing the Christian walk a little differently now. All right, you have to go to the end. But he asked you to do another thing. He said, there are two things you do during this period. He said, first, you will fear not. And second, you will be faithful unto death. And when you are faithful unto death, I will give you a crown of life. Now, since we do not have information on the Bible about the church of Smyrna, we have to go to history. And we say John, the, the apostle John lived from 6 to 180. Some people say 120. I, I would like to go a more than 100 years. I think, I think Paul died a little, a little later than that. But it's between 180 and 120. So he had another guy by the name of uh, Polycraft. Cap. He lived from 70 AD to 155 AD. He was the Bishop of Smyrna at the time of John's writing. He was the pastor of the Church of Smyrna. So this guy, Polycarp, he was hunted down. He was, they, they, they were, the, the, the emperor at the time was looking for him to kill him. And he was at one, one place where he resort. Uh, to, to take a rest. And then the, the people there beseech him that he should move, that he should leave. So he left that place and he went to some, he went somewhere else where he can hide from the emperor. So the emperor sent their soldiers to look for Polycarp. And they got two young men and they beat them up and they tortured them until they, they told the soldiers where Polycarp was hiding. And they went and they found him. When they found the Polycarp, uh, he, he went to the door. He opened the door. He invited them in. 
They said they are looking for a guy by the name of Paulie Cap. He said, I am he. So they were surprised that this guy was 86 years old and the emperor still wanted to kill him. He was, he was 86 years old. So he invited them in. He offered them food to eat. They sat down and they eat. And he asked them, could you let me pray for one hour undisturbed? And they said, sure, no problem. So he went to his room and he was, he prayed for one hour. He prayed for two hours, two hours. And then he was ready to go with the soldiers. And they took him, they took him to the arena where they was going to kill him. And he they were going to nail him. Hey, they were you. going to nail him to a cross. He said, you don't, there is no reason for you to, 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 to do that. I will stand in the fire. And he stood in the fire and he was burned to death. And, and they ask him, they say, well, would you deny Jesus? He said, for 80 and six years, I served him. And he did nothing wrong to me. Why should I deny him? And Polycarp, he died that day. It is said the day that he died was a Sabbath day. And the Jews came out on that particular day to gather wood, which they should not have been doing. They broke the Sabbath to make sure that Polycap died that day. Hmm. Just to make sure that he died. So Polycap was one of his faithful martyrs. And there were 10 other people from Ephesus who died with Polycap that day. This church, they had no condemnation. And the Lord had nothing bad to say about this church. And he said, he that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. He that overcome will not be hurt in the second death. Now, he said, I will give thee a crown of life. Let's take a look at that. For a Christian, we, we were talking about you dying. You, 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 we were talking about everybody will be tried for their work, all the work that they do in their body. And the Lord said, I will give you a crown of life. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. And there are five crowns that a Christian can receive. Five crowns. An incorruptible crown. That is for a disciplined life. A crown of rejoicing. That is for a soul winner. A crown of righteousness. And that is for those who love his appearance. And not only a crown of righteousness, but he had clothed me with a garment of salvation and he had covered me with a robe of righteousness. So that is a complete outfit. You have the, the garment, which is a regular garment. You have the robe of righteousness and you have a, a, a crown of righteousness. Now, the Lord talked about a crown to the church of Ephesus because the people in Ephesus was used to that. They had a vine that they would wrap as a crown and put it on their head, or they would put flowers around, uh, a crown of flowers on their head. So the Lord know where they live. He know their culture. And he used what they know to explain what he wants them to know. And that's why he said, I will give you a crown, a crown of life. Everybody in Ephesus know about wearing a crown. So you have the incorruptible crown. You have the crown of re rejoicing. You have the crown of righteousness. And for pastors, you have the crown of glory for taking care of his flock. And then you have the crown of life. Now the crown of life is different from the gift of life. When you become a Christian, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. You have the gift of life. The crown of life is additional to that. And as we go through Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you will see the many different uh, uh, gifts the Lord is going to give you. And in James chapter 1 verse 12, it said this is for endurance, enduring trials, and enduring testing. Uh, you receive a crown of life. Well, according to this, Jesus said, if you are faithful unto death, I believe it's a martyr's crown. So you have five crowns that you can receive. However, 
you could be walking through heaven bareheaded without a crown. Because Paul said that your works, when it is tried, it might burn up. And when your work is burned up, you yourself will not be lost, but you just would be, be walking around heaven bareheaded. Whereas some people might have five crowns on their head. He said, he that overcometh overcome shall not be hurt in the second death. And the verses I would use for that is Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, and Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. But the rest of the dead live not until a thousand years was finished. This is the first resurrection. This is where we are aiming to be, in the first resurrection. You are in Christ, you will be part of the first resurrection. And if you are not in Christ, then you will be part of the second death. And death and hell was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. I have a, a, a chart here, and this is a Clarence Larkin chart. If you ever had the book on uh, any one of Clarence Larkin book, you will see it starts off here with the rapture, the church meeting Christ in the air. And then we will go into the the, the church in heaven and this is where we would be sit uh, Christ will be on the beam of Christ the, the judgment seat of Christ and we will re be receiving one of these five crowns or all of these five crowns or two or three of these crowns and on the right hand side you would see if your work is made out of wood or hay or stubble it will be burnt up in the fire and if it's made on the left hand side with gold and silver and precious uh, stones, you will be you will have something to offer to the Lord. And this is where the the bema of Christ will take place. It is a reward ceremony, not a judgment to depart from heaven or to be departed from the Lord. After that, we go into the marriage supper of the Lamb. So this is where. We would close here today with the five judgments. I apologize that the slides didn't work today. And, uh, you know, we, would, we could do something about that next week. So, Pastor Michael, I would stop there and I will turn back over to you.